So if you were at my homily last month, you heard me talk about um, how much my uh, grandson was enamored by all the four or five dogs that lived in our cul-de-sac. And he knew all their names at age four, and he even knew their various different barks. And he insisted that all these dogs prayed. Do you remember that? Well, the story goes on. <laughs> Another dog homily. It'll be the last one, believe me. Six months later, uh, we caved and we got my grandson a dog. There was a new king in our house, and his name was Paul. Paul was a terrier mutt of some kind. My daughter found him while she was uh, volunteering at the Humane Society. And little Paul was recovering from abuse, abuse from his previous owner. Um, unfortunately, he had been, um, they told my daughter that he had been tied to a tree and left to starve, that the pads on his paws were burned off from being on hot concrete for hours and hours. And the vet there said that little Paul should be about 12 to 15 pounds. So when we brought him to the house, or when my daughter brought him to the house, we put him on the scale, and he was five pounds. He had hardly any fur at all. And the other thing we found curious about Paul was he didn't bark. I think the trauma that that poor dog had been through just shut him down completely. He couldn't even bark. So there he was. And in the caring hands of our daughter and my wife and my four-and-a-half-year-old grandson, they brought him back to life. They fed him for 15 days, and that dog was eating better than me. He was the king of the house. And they gave him liver and chicken and all this stuff to get his strength back so he could finally walk. He couldn't even walk. And, um, and they even got him little outfits to wear. Uh, and the thing that really probably was hardest for me is they gave him my favorite chair. <laughs> my lazy boy chair that I have right in front of the TV where I can watch the football games, that dog had my chair. And uh, right through all that, uh, all that whole period, I walked up to him one day and I said, you know what, Paul, when this is over, I'm getting my chair back. And guess what he did? He barked for the first time. <laughs> It was probably like, you know, that kind of a bark, like, yeah, we'll see. But isn't it funny how such a helpless little creature can win the hearts of an entire family, right? You know, I think about that little Gabriel over there. He's already won your hearts. I got news for you. He will be the king of your house, <laughs> if he isn't already. But, you know, it's interesting. Um, they went out of their way to to bring this dog back to life. It was like the corporal works of mercy for pets. And here's the question I have, and this is, this is not any condemnation of any of you, but you know, sometimes I say to myself, looking around our world, do we do the same for our brothers and sisters that are hurting and abused and starving? Why is it easier to care for dogs than it is each other? And you know the answer to that, especially if you're a dog lover, because people are so difficult. <laughs> you're not doing it right. I don't like it's the way you're doing this. You know, people can be so difficult to help. And sometimes the most difficult people to help are the ones that are closest to us who don't always seem to appreciate it, right? And you've probably heard the expression, he was treated like a dog. Well, that expression is not one we would use for our pets in America today, right? We love our pets, and rightly so. But traditionally, that phrase meant to be treated badly 
to be treated like a dog. It meant that you were taking a beating or that you were being abused or you were looking, looked down on. Christ, our true king, Jesus Christ, the king of kings, there he is, right? In our gospel today, he doesn't look like that. He's treated like a dog. In the old sense of the phrase, he's beaten to a pulp. He's left to carry that cross up that torturous hill. He's practically bled out. He's decorated with a crown of thorns. And he's executed in the worst form of capital punishment ever devised by the Romans, crucifixion. And yet it is on the cross that Jesus is proclaimed to be king. And it wasn't so much that the Romans did that by placing that sarcastic sign over the cross, king of the Jews, you know, I-N-R-I, but rather on the cross, Jesus was proclaimed to be king by the criminal, the criminal who is dying beside him. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That recognition, even on the cross, our bloody Lord, that criminal recognized this is the true king, the king of the world. And Jesus demonstrates his real power as a king in the power of forgiveness. He didn't, sit, he didn't hang there and go, that's it for all of you guys. You're going to have it coming to you. You know, my wife and I were just talking the other day about we like to watch movies. I mean, we're, we're in the Netflix and all that. But you know about the 90% of the movies that you watch are always about revenge? Somebody is... Uh, you know, criminalized, and they go out to get him. They got to get that revenge. But not our Lord. No, he says to that repentant criminal, this day you will be with me in paradise. I think, wow, really? Last second salvation. Cheap grace. Saved by the bell. An entire life spent as a criminal, and he admitted it. He says, we deserve what we got, but not him. And all is forgiven, and heaven is guaranteed. Bishop Fulton Sheen said, that man was the luckiest man in the world. Instant salvation. That is our God. That is the benefit that all of us have as children of the king. We are king's kids. And you know, we Americans, we don't do real good with that concept of a king, right? Our country was founded on getting away from an abusive king. And I believe it might have been Thomas Jefferson, I might have to fact check this, but I heard this once said. He said the most benevolent, the best form of government is a monarchy, but the safest is a democracy. Find us a good king who's beneficial. We have one, Jesus Christ. He is our king. And in that regal moment, what does he do? His last words, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And perhaps the greatest sacrifice that you and I are called to make is the sacrifice of forgiving those who have hurt us. And as we go into Thanksgiving this week, there's always that one at the table <laughs> that we have a hard time with, isn't there? Jesus on the cross forgave those who conspired against him, who conspired to kill him. He forgave the soldiers who brutalized him. He forgave his disciples who deserted him. And he saw our sins and he took them on. And he embraced the cross that we might be restored to grace and not just the world in general, but you and I, as St. Paul often says, Jesus indwells in us. That's incredible, isn't it? 
you know, it's harder to say you are forgiven than it is to say, I'm sorry. But that's the way of our king. That's the way of our king, forgiving the criminal, the mockers, and the executioners, and us. It's always the way of the kingdom. It is our way. It is the way to be a child of the king, to truly be a king's kid. May this Eucharist we receive today give us that strength. Amen.